Hi, I'm John Kendall, Director of Archives and Football Information here at the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Here at the Pro Football Hall of Fame's archive, we house over 40 million pages of documents, 6 million photographic images, and nearly 30,000 artifacts related not just to the history of the game, but really every player, coach, and contributor who helped build the game to what it is today. We're going to take you behind the scenes into the archives to show you some of the most forgotten pieces of NFL history. This Canton Bulldogs jersey from 1922 is almost 100 years old, and you can see it's, it's a much different material than what players are wearing today. This is a, a wool or cotton material, a little heavier, more of a sweater type material, a lot smaller than, than what you would think a, a football player of today would wear. One of the reasons is the padding that, that the players wore, smaller leather padding, not a lot of padding within the shoulder pads, the long sleeves, you know, you look at the new uniforms with the moisture wicking material, the nylons, there's almost four or five different materials used in one single uniform. So surprisingly, this chunk of wood is actually a piece of a goalpost from Yankee Stadium. And this goalpost came from the 1958 NFL Championship game. A lot of people refer to this as the greatest game ever played. This game really ushered in the television era in the National Football League. Coach Television has done a superb job of informing the population. It ultimately became the first sudden death overtime championship game in NFL history. United to Amici. Amici powers in. the Baltimore Colts versus the New York Giants. It was the first nationally televised championship game in NFL history. Goal post totter as Yankee Stadium closes down a glorious Giants season and the greatest game ever played. This is made of a balsa wood. It's actually three pieces of wood put together. This was during the time of the H-shaped goal post. This goalpost would have been on the goal line still. Uh, it wasn't until the 1970s that they moved the goalpost back to the end line. With an artifact such as this made of wood, we want to make sure that in our archives we're keeping very consistent temperature and humidity levels. We want to keep it out of direct sunlight and we want to keep it obviously dry. That way we're able to make sure that it's preserved for future generations. Defensively, they don't seem to be coming off the ball. Maybe 53 and 52. So yes, sir. Okay. yes, sir. This bench was used on the sidelines of Lambeau Field in Vince Lombardi's last game in Green Bay. Sellout crowd has braved the coldest New Year's Eve in the history of Green Bay, Wisconsin. It was the Ice Bowl, the NFL Championship on December 31st, 1967. One of the coldest games in NFL history. It's cold. The Green Bay Packers would go on to defeat the Dallas Cowboys, winning their third straight NFL championship and going to Super Bowl II. He's got the quarterback taking each single touchdown, and the Green Bay Packers are going to be NFL champions. This is just one of many that would have been stacked side by side on the sideline. As you can see, we've come a long way on sideline equipment today, where you have heated benches and fans to cool you down in the summertime. One of my favorite stories in pro football history is the reintegration of the sport in 1946. From 1934 until 1945, there was a lockout of African-American players, not just in pro football, but through all major sports in North America. Here you can see this contract where Bill Willis is making $4,000 to play for the 1946 season. And I love on the back, the handwritten note that his signing bonus would be $100, which was initialed by Willis and Paul Brown, his general manager. An incredible middle guard with cat-like reflexes, Bill Willis would ultimately be enshrined in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Known as the Forgotten Four, Bill Willis, Mary Motley, Kenny Washington, and Woody Strode reintegrating pro football in 1946, one year before Jackie Robinson integrated Major League Baseball, opened the door for African Americans to integrate sports all over this country. So it gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce to you Lou Kriegmer, my friend and teammate. This helmet here was donated to the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 1996 when Lou Kriegmer was enshrined in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Lou Kriegmer was a fierce competitor on the offensive side of the ball mainly. 
This is a helmet he wore in the early 1950s. As you see, this was when the helmet started to evolve and face masks started to become in vogue. And he screwed this metal face mask into the helmet. Early in the 1950s, this was fairly uncommon, but as the decade moved further along, more and more players started to try to find some type of face protection. Otto Graham, famous for his Lucite face mask that Paul Brown designed and developed when he broke his jaw. You can see the inside of the helmet has a web suspension style which kept the crown of the head off of the outside portion of this leather helmet. Helmet technology became more advanced. A hard shell helmet was created along with the tubular bar face mask that you see moving through the rest of that decade. Gives the ball to Dirk Walker. Walker is on the loose. The former flash from SMU tears 67 yards for Detroit's second score of the day. This is a fascinating shoe. The 1948 Heisman Trophy winner, Doak Walker. This was a shoe that he wore during his career, played a significant role in the championship teams of the Detroit Lions. He did it all. He ran, passed, caught passes, returned kicks, and even did the Lions kicking duties. So after he ran and scored a touchdown, he could easily zip the shoe off put his kicking shoe on and kick the extra point. This shoe is very rare. Not every player had a zip away shoe that they could change quickly after scoring a touchdown to put their kicking shoe on. And this shoe was actually donated by Doak himself to showcase just how versatile he was as a player. And what a touchdown. In front of me here, a pair of glasses that were worn by Bob Greasy in the 1978 Hall of Fame game. Bob Greasy didn't start wearing glasses until the 1977 season when it was determined that he was legally blind in his right eye. Interestingly enough, on Thanksgiving Day of that season, he threw for six touchdowns. He's in the open! He's got it! Touchdown! Dolphin! Eric Dickerson was well known for wearing Rex Specs, which were an eyeglass used specifically for athletics. Before his time, though, Bob Greasy would wear these eyeglasses through the rest of his career when he retired in 1980. As you can see here, uh, to make them more athletic, he would wear this uh, support system in the back. Today, you won't see many players wearing any type of eyeglasses with contact lenses and the advances in that type of technology. I feel like Earl Campbell, though, with these thigh pads. After last week's lick. These might not look like much, but these have a very interesting story. These are Brett Favre thigh pads. The first and only time that we have ever deaccessioned an artifact to go back to its owner to be used on the field the following season. Fourth and 13, big rush. Favre gets away, lobs it in the air. Someone's there. Oh, it's caught at the goal line for a touchdown. After Brett Favre retired from the Green Bay Packers, he donated his entire uniform and was coaxed out of retirement by the New York Jets. And after he signed, contacted the Pro Football Hall of Fame and needed these custom fitted thigh pads back to be able to play in the game the next season. And he continued to finish his career with the New York Jets and then ultimately the Minnesota Vikings. When he retired after the 2010 season, donated these back the Pro Football Hall of Fame. So this is Otto Graham's uniform from the 1952 season. One of the unique things about this uniform is Otto Graham was a phenomenal leader and in 1952, the NFL brought about rule change that each position on the field had to have a unique set of numbers. And Otto Graham always had an iconic number 60 that he wore through his time with the Cleveland Browns. He was deemed a national star and didn't have to change his jersey number, but the type of leader that he was, if the rest of his teammates had to do it, he was going to do it as well. So he changed to number 14. Instead of issuing him a new uniform, with the number 14 on it. They actually just stripped away the 60, sewed 14 back onto the jersey, and you can still see the outline of number 60 that he wore during the first part of his career. This is a very unique artifact in the Pro Football Hall of Fame's collection. This is a wristband worn by Tom Maddy of the Baltimore Colts in 1965. This would be the first known instance where a wristband was used to call plays in the huddle.
The story is, is that Johnny Unitas had gotten injured, his backup then got injured, and Tom Maddy, who had played quarterback at Ohio State, who wasn't drafted by the Colts to play quarterback, was enlisted into the duty of playing quarterback. So Don Shula, the legendary coach, designed this wristband that he could write the plays down so that he knew what plays were running and how to call them in the huddle. For reference, this is the type of wristband that an NFL quarterback would use today. Three panels of plays where the Matty wristband just has one panel, much smaller handwriting. A side note is that his wife, who actually had better penmanship than Matty, ended up writing the plays on the sheet to make sure that it was legible enough for him to call the play. Tom Maddy with another touchdown bomb. The world champion Cleveland Browns, minus Otto Graham, but equipped with shortwave radio for their league opener. So this piece might not look like much, but it had a significant impact of the game as we know it today. This is the helmet receiver piece Coach Paul Brown put into his quarterback's helmet. His quarterback at the time was George Ratterman, who had just taken over after Otto Graham retired after the 1955 season. Coach Paul Brown would send in the plays from the sidelines using one of his guards. Cleveland coach Paul Brown uses his signal calling shuttle system as he sends guard Chuck Knoll into the game with the play. Didn't want to continue using the guard to call plays, so worked to develop a receiver that he could communicate to call in the plays. Let's get this thing rolling. This looked like a mechanism. Did they blitz that time? Split right, 24. Opposite. This radio element fit just above George Ratterman's ear, very similar spot to where quarterbacks of today are getting their radio transmission from the sidelines. The helmet receiver had mixed reviews early on. You felt like an idiot with the thing because it was an antenna and you would have to turn like that. So I'd have to stand outside the huddle going like this, you know, until he came in loud and clear. The frequency that was sometimes used would also catch APBs from police. And in one instance, the Giants actually latched on to the same frequency, called over a former Browns player to decipher the plays that Paul Brown was calling. Quarterback and chief radio operator George Ratterman tries to get a Cleveland pass on the beam, but New York's Ed Hughes is guarding all frequencies. When word got out that Paul Brown was using this new technology, the league looked into it, and even though the Browns had used it for a few games into the regular season, ultimately the league stepped in and banned it from use until when the NFL approved quarterback to coach communication and put the helmet receiver back into the quarterback's helmet. The Bears head downfield again. Sid Luckman, one of the greatest T formation quarterbacks in the business, gets off a pass. Here we have Sid Luckman, legendary quarterback of the Chicago Bears jersey, along with his T formation playbook. You see, he was able to absorb those plays. In a short time, he probably studied most of the night. Sid Luckman played quarterback for the Bears from 1939 to 1950. This is a notebook that Sid Luckman used to learn the intricacies of the T formation, which was a secret weapon that the Bears used in the 1940 NFL Championship. It was the T formation with a man in motion at his best. Longtime coach Clark Shaughnessy had used the T formation at Stanford and helped Luckman and George Hallis bring it into the Chicago Bears. You can certainly see the evolution of the uniform taking place. This here is a much thinner material. Bears fans will remember the iconic number 42 that Luckman wore throughout his career with the Chicago Bears. So this is a very rare piece. The Bears tied in 1932 season with win percentage with the Portsmouth Spartans. Neither one of the Bears or the Spartans had any interest in becoming co-champions of the National Football League that year. And so they petitioned the league to host a playoff game. The winner of that would ultimately become the NFL champion with the highest win percentage. Here you can see in this 1932 postseason game, the game was originally scheduled to be played at Wrigley Field, the home of the Chicago Bears. However, because of a blizzard, the game was moved indoors to Chicago Stadium, where they would actually play on an 80-yard field. There was a circus that was in town and was held in Chicago Stadium the week before. So the best guess that we have is that soil from the circus was still laid down on the flooring of Chicago Stadium. It was packed down, making a football field. One of the interesting things about 
This piece is not very many of these game programs survived. They were stored in a facility and in the 1960s there was a fire which burned a lot of their collection. You can see along the bottom and the left corner here that the game program is charred. The Bears ended up winning the game on a Bronco Nagurski touchdown pass. So some of the repercussions of this game were significant rule changes. The forward pass before this game was legal, but you had to be five yards behind the line of scrimmage to throw a forward pass. At the owners' meetings after this playoff game, they changed the rule that anywhere behind the line of scrimmage you could throw a forward pass. And this is really the first change that the National Football League made to college football rules. Forward pass is thrown by laying the ball in the hand with either one finger or the thumb. And it's thrown above the shoulder, straight past the eyebrows with the forward point up. And the passer follows through. So since 1997, the Pro Football Hall of Fame has received the draft card of every player drafted in the National Football League. Our most famous draft card is actually from the 2000 draft. He was a six round pick, 199 overall by the New England Patriots, Tom Brady. And for me, this draft card really signifies taking advantage of your opportunities. Kept that chip on his shoulder. When Drew Bledsoe goes down, he steps in and then ultimately leads them to a Super Bowl victory. Tom Brady and the New England Patriots walk through the Pro Football Hall of Fame during the 2019 enshrinement ceremony. And I had the opportunity to run down to the Pro Football Hall of Fame's archive and grab his draft card. It was the first time that Tom Brady had ever seen his draft card. He took a picture of it, posted it on his social media platforms. For the Pro Football Hall of Fame, preserving these draft cards is significant because it really is the start of a legacy that they continue to build upon throughout their entire career. One of the scouting reports that we have in the Hall of Fame's collection is actually related to Jerry Rice, but it's a USFL scouting report and a lot of people don't realize that Jerry Rice, while he was selected in the first round, 16th overall by the San Francisco 49ers in the NFL draft, was actually taken as number one player overall by the Birmingham Stallions in the USFL. This scout writes that Jerry Rice had good character, good intelligence, good work habits, plays with good physical and mental toughness, fluid movement, above average run after the catch. Touchdown in the Super Bowl. However, he has a tendency to relax when play is away and is an average blocker. You'll also notice here there's a difference between 40-yard dash speed and playing speed. He's ahead of everybody. Goodbye. Jerry Rice was clocked at 4.56 in the 40-yard dash. Touchdown, Jerry Rice, number five. This particular scout actually added, I graded this player too low this past spring. Has all the physical and mental tools to be a good one. He must be the greatest receiver. He's a bad man. Here are some of my favorite documents in the Pro Football Hall of Fame's archive. They are Coach Paul Brown's defensive play sheets and scouting reports. Here is a football team with a textbook. Players insert the mimeograph plays, and many hours are spent in study. He really brought in this modern era of football that we see today, the types of scouting that he was doing. These are 1940s scouting reports where he's not only scouting teams and one or two players, he's going through the entire roster and scouting how good these players were on offense, how good they were on defense, really diving in deep in terms of what they did well and what they didn't do well so that he knew how their teams could attack them. Here you see some of his defensive play sheets here, drew up how they were going to stop a particular opponent. It's easy to think somebody's doing a heck of a job and then you get the pictures and you find some guy that you hadn't thought much about is doing better than the guy you thought was doing a heck of a job. It's detailed scientific study, the pictures never lie. Paul Brown was really the, the first coach that was breaking down film, bringing that classroom work into professional football. At one point in time, he and his teams went to 10 straight championship games, winning seven of them. Cleveland is overjoyed. The Browns are the champions of the world again. Here we have notebooks from the all-time winningest coach in NFL history, Coach Don Shula. These are from his 1974 season. 
Coach Shula was kind enough to donate his entire collection to the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And you really get a sense of just what makes Coach Don Shula or coaches like him so special, the meticulous nature that they go through. Let's get something out of the drill. Everything we do is for a reason. These are all meeting notes. He has his daily itinerary. The only coach that can say that he guided a team to a perfect season. Miami has won Super Bowl seven. When you win 17 games without a defeat, that is perfect. Here we get into the season review where he's making notes about specific players, specific aspects of a game that, that maybe he wanted to change moving in the off season. I think the most underrated aspect of professional football is the mental side of the game. Hold up, hold up, what's wrong with our snap count? Back in a huddle, let's go. And you get a sense when you look through and just how much time they put into the classroom work. And you can see here with Coach Don Chula how meticulous he is and the way that he continued to drive to be successful. So this is one box from the Dutch Sterneman collection. A lot of people don't realize that Dutch Sterneman was actually the co-founder of the Chicago Bears with George Hallis in 1920. Co-owned the Bears until 1932 when he sold his share to Hallis outright during the Depression, but not before he kept meticulous records of the early business of the National Football League. Play-by-play -play sheets, game contracts, the counting ledgers, and ticket distributions in the front cover of the game program from 1925 against the Cleveland Bulldogs. You've got George Hallis and Dutch Sterneman, the co-founders of the Chicago Bears. $1,200 was the guaranteed sum for the visiting team. Now, this is all part of the Red Grange Tour. So Red Grange being the first major college superstar to sign a pro contract. So Sterneman was also integral in developing equipment these are the first known interchangeable cleat. You can see here, depending on the, the style of terrain that you were playing on, you had a pin and a tongue and groove that you could take the pin out, insert a new cleat. This Dutch Sternman collection is probably the most historically significant collection in the Pro Football Hall of Fame's archive. Dutch Sternman and George Hallis, while they were the co-owners of the Chicago Bears, he wouldn't have this by his side while the game was going on because he was actually playing in the game. They were co-owners, but they were players, they were coaches, they really did it all. You know, as they were traveling from town to town on the train, these were part of his normal duties. That's what makes this even more remarkable that it survived this many years. He collected and maintained and made sure that for future generations, this story was going to be able to be told.